much. Good morning and uh, welcome to those of us in the room and, and those of us online. I'm glad that, you're, that we're all together for worship this morning. And a special word of welcome to those of you who are with us for the very first time. If you want to get to know our pastors and staff or get to know more about the full life of ministry here at Arapaho, check out our website, arapahoumc.org, and slash connect or new. Um, you'll find a connection card there that will help put you in touch with our team, and we'd love to get to know you. Um, in 2019, Pew Research found the following, that 80% of Americans surveyed believe that we have, quote, far too little trust in each other. 80% of Americans believe we have far too little trust in each other. If you'd count yourself among the 80%, let me hear a little quick amen just to see if Pew, Pew was pretty on spot then. Okay. 70% of those surveyed um, said that they believe that lack of trust is a serious impediment to the kinds of uh, changes and and the the kinds of things we need to do to address the issues that we face as a a people. And then 65% of those surveyed said that they believe the already low level of trust we have is shrinking on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis. And maybe you identify with those numbers that I just quoted. Maybe you have felt yourself um, diminishing in trust, whether that be generally or even just personally. I don't know if there's anyone in the room like me that uh, I honestly, as as a person, naturally tend to be fairly trusting, but there have been experiences throughout my life and in my teenage years and young adulthood and into adulthood that have made me slower to trust in a way that sometimes I grieve, quite frankly. Is that just me? Trust is is a huge issue that we face as individuals and as a collective people. And and trust is at the heart of the story that we find in Scripture today. We are concluding a four-week journey through the letter to the Colossians, Paul's letter to this church in a city that he'd never been to, a a Christian community he did not personally know. He only knew about them uh, through prison bars in Rome. And he writes a letter to them uh, all about this theme of reconciling faith. And he starts out big and grandiose, as Paul always does, and and over the course of four chapters, he narrows his vision, narrows his vision, narrows his vision, until finally, aha, in chapter four, we're finally going to know why Paul wrote in the first place. And if you've been with us for these last three weeks, you're probably waiting with bated breath, what in the world have we been working towards, right? Um, So in chapter four, Paul opens up and he he tells them to pray. And this is classic Paul. Pray, pray, pray. Pray for me, pray for you, pray to God, pray, 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 pray. Paul loves when we pray. And then we get to verse seven. It says, Tukakis. It's a tough junior high experience. Tukakis, our dearly loved brother, faithful minister and fellow slave in the Lord will inform you about everything that has happened to me. This is why I sent him to you so that you'll know all about us and so he can encourage your hearts. I sent him with Onesimus, your faithful and dearly loved brother who is one of you. They will let you know about everything here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, says hello to you. So does Mark, Barnabas's cousin, yada, da, 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 blah, blah, blah. Did you miss it? Did you see it? Did you hear it? It was right there whole reason Paul wrote. It was right there in those words. If I were to ask you to name some of the heroes of the Bible, seriously, shout shout a couple out at me real quick. Jesus, that's a good one, Kenton. Thank you. (laughs) Kenton wins the Sunday school answer. Jesus, who else is a hero from the Bible? If you're online, post a name online that that you know is a hero of the Bible. Heroes of the Bible. Deborah, Moses, it's so hard to hear in this echoey room. Joseph, John from the, from the Acolytes. Anybody online with me? I don't know how long our tape delay is, but maybe it's just long enough. I'll come back and check them. It's funny. I didn't hear anybody say Onesimus. <laughs> right? It even elicits a chuckle. Onesimus, a hero of the Bible? You may not have even noticed his name in that, in that onslaught there. In fact, Paul's going to go on to name a whole bunch of other people before he closes out the chapter, but that name Onesimus is everything. Onesimus is a hero of the Bible, even though my spell check on my computer thinks his name is misspelled. Onesimus <laughs> is a hero. He's a hero we don't talk about a lot, but in a place and a people who lack trust, Onesimus is a hero and one that I think we need. 
To understand why, you've got to understand what's not on the page. Oh, I see Mary listed twice. Thank you, online crew. Mary, yes, Mary. Um, to understand why Onesimus is a hero, we, we have to understand what's not on the page. The story behind this simple mention of a name and how it leads us, in fact, to another letter that will be our text today. Onesimus was a slave. He, he lived in Colossae in the house of a man named Philemon. Philemon was the eldest male of a household. He was the potter familius, like we talked about uh, last week, the, the eldest male who oversees uh, the entire household, oversees the family and the servants and the slaves. And, and Onesimus uh, serves uh, Philemon. Philemon, additionally, in addition to, to running this house, he also is uh, the, the home that invites Christian community in Colossae. They didn't meet in brick-and-mortar churches like we have today for the first couple centuries of the Christian movement. What they had were people homes. Philemon had a home, and Philemon was the place where the Christian community in Colossae met. Onesimus wasn't a part of that Christian community. He was just a slave in his master's house. And one day, Onesimus flees. We don't know why. That part isn't shared with us in Scripture. We could uh, presume or assume or, or theorize a number of things. Uh, perhaps Onesimus uh, was mistreated to such a degree that he felt he needed to leave. Perhaps he became 30 years old, and there was somewhat of a cultural custom that once you turned 30, uh, frequently masters would offer freedom to their slaves or servants uh, if they chose to accept it, and maybe Philemon didn't extend this offer graciously, and so Philemon left. The, the reality is we don't, know Phil, uh, we don't know why Onesimus left, but we know that he did. We know that one day he decided to take his own liberation into his own hands, and he ran. And he ran to Rome, Rome being a major city, easy to get lost in a crowd, and also a place where uh, runaway slaves would frequently travel to. Perhaps he also went to Rome because he knew of someone there named Paul. And because he knew his master Philemon was one of these Christians, and Paul was one of these things they called apostles, and he was kind of in charge of this Christian movement thing, maybe he went to Rome to seek out Paul so that Paul could be an advocate for him with his former master. This also would have been not unexpected. What is unexpected is that what, what Onesimus finds is not just an advocate, uh, but a friend, and Paul finds in Onesimus a disciple. They begin this relationship, this discipling relationship journey that we don't know how long it lasts. Maybe it's weeks, maybe it's months, maybe it's years, but Onesimus comes to faith in Christ through Paul's leadership and ends up devoting his life to Paul to, to, because Paul is, is under arrest. He, he can't get out and do all the things he would normally do, so Onesimus acts as, as one of his uh, followers and, and performs tasks for Paul and serves Paul in that way. Until one day Paul becomes convicted and convinced that it's time for Onesimus to return home. Not as a slave, but as, as something different. And so he, he encourages Onesimus to return as a messenger with Tukakis, who we heard about before. And Onesimus and Tukakis are going to carry a number of letters and messages for churches along the way from Rome to Colossae. That's a long journey. And Onesimus is going to be the one that delivers these words of teaching and encouragement and challenge to all these Christian communities. But there's a destination, Colossae, the place that he fled, and not just Colossae, but Philemon and Philemon's house, the man that he fled. And Onesimus goes back not just with a letter for Colossae, but also with a letter for Philemon. It's the only letter in the New Testament that Paul writes to a person and not a people. It's also only 25 verses long. Can you imagine your whole life hanging in the balance of somebody else's 25 verses? Would that give you a little bit of trepidation? How many times did Onesimus have to think through those 25 verses every step of the journey from Rome to Philemon's house? Do you see why I say Onesimus is a hero? The faith that he possesses to go on this task, to go on this journey, I don't possess that kind of a faith. Do you? Onesimus agrees to this daunting task. And what we have in exchange is one of the great gifts of Scripture, this letter to Philemon. It comes to us at the very end of Paul's epistles in the New Testament. Like I said, it's so short you'll miss it if you're flipping through. Let me see if I can find it fairly easily. Boom, I'm a pro. I'm right there. One page. I missed it by one. I was in Hebrews for a second. 
Philemon is so short, you could read it in about three minutes, depending on how fast you read. But you should take a lot longer to spend with it because it is so rich and so beautiful and instructive, not just for one person, but I would say for the church universal. There's this one passage that really gets to the heart of what Paul is asking. Paul starts out the letter by saying, hey, how you doing? I'm Paul. You heard of me. I know. Uh, a greetings to you in the name of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, yada, yada, yada. And then he does a little buttering up of Philemon, because when you're going to ask somebody for something big, what do you do first? You're so great. You're so wonderful. Mom, you're the best mom in the world. By the way, can I have the car keys, right? Um, Philemon, you're so wonderful. You're so great. Oh, your partnership and ministry. Oh, the way you open up your home. Oh, you're so generous. You're so good, Philemon. Oh, if I could have 20 of you, I'd be blessed, right? And then he gets to verse 8. Therefore, ah, here we are, the therefore from Paul. Though I have enough confidence in Christ to command you to do the right thing, I would rather appeal to you through love. Now, now pause just a moment to say this. You're going to hear in Paul's language with 21st century ears something of a passive-aggressive voice, but let's read Paul with more sincerity than we might think, right? Paul, Paul is not saying, you know, I could tell you to do the right thing, but I'm going to appeal to you in love. I mean, we could sort of read it that way, but really I think Paul is being humble in his saying, you know, I'm the Apostle Paul. I have authority in the church. You're a, you're a location of the church. I could tell you right now, free Onesimus, full, full stop, uh, break his chains, receive him back into your house as an equal. I could tell you to do that, but I'm going to withhold my power for a second. I'm going to withhold my power for a second and invite you into this conversation because I want to appeal to you out of love. He says, I, Paul, an old man, okay, maybe a little passive-aggressive, an old man and now also a prisoner for Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my child Onesimus. And he's not being demeaning here. He's using language of a discipler. This is common language for Paul to use with those whom he disciples. I became his father in the faith during my time in prison. He was useless to you before, but now he is useful to both of us. And again, he's not being mean. He's actually doing a play on words with Onesimus' name that means something of usefulness. And he's saying, for this time now, Onesimus has been gone. He hasn't been serving you. He's been useless to you. But now I'm sending him back to be something greater, something more for both of us, for the, for the church as it is. I'm sending him back to you, which is like sending you my own heart, Paul says. I considered keeping him with me so that he might serve me in your place during my time in prison because of the gospel. However, I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that your act of kindness would occur willingly and not under pressure. Maybe this is the reason that Onesimus was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, that is, as a dearly loved brother." He is especially a dearly loved brother to me. How much more can he become a brother to you personally and spiritually in the Lord? So if you really consider me a partner, welcome Onesimus as if you were welcoming me. If he has harmed you in any way or owes your money, charge it to my account. Aha, the big ask the moment that we've been waiting for. This is why Paul wrote two letters and sent them with Onesimus all the way to Colossae. There's three layers to this ask that I think are important for us to consider, to, to see what Paul is really asking here. The first has to do with the language that, that Paul uses in this sort of family ties language, right? If you look at the letter of Philemon, in 25 verses, Paul uses familial language when referring to people or even to God 10 times. That's, that's a lot. He's dressing this entire argument in the language of brother and sister and father and child, right? He, he's asking Philemon not just to, in this sort of cutesy way, but, but I think there's a depth here that he's, he's asking Philemon to see the people in this Christian community, even those whom he once saw through, purely through an economic lens as, as something to be exploited or used for his own benefit, but instead to see each other as family and siblings in the best possible sense, because that means something in those days, especially the bonds of family were, were tighter, deeper, richer than even the bonds of neighbor or, or people of your same citizenry. The bonds of family were something distinct and different. 
Paul is framing this Christian movement in this language of the family of faith that we still hear echoed today. He's asking Philemon to no longer see a slave, but to see a brother. And it takes on even more significance when we consider the location of this first century church, which was where? It was in Philemon's home. Philemon, do you see how different your world is now? You've invited the gospel into your heart, into your home, but do you see how much that changes the way you have to see the people in your life? One of my favorite things to do in life is to invite people over to our home. Reagan and I love having people over for dinner, mainly because Reagan loves people and because I love dinner. And (laughs) I do. I love to cook. I love big meals. I love making the kitchen messy and getting someone else to clean it when I'm done. It's the I cook, you clean kind of a mantra in our house, and we have people over for dinner. And also, there's laundry on the couch, and it's a disaster. My son may or may not have pants on, right? He's almost three, okay? Um, and, uh, but there's something special and sacred about inviting people over to your home for dinner. It's different than going out to a restaurant because there's a level of platonic intimacy, right? A level of, of seeing each other and the, the way that you live. And yeah, there is laundry on the couch. And yeah, the, the kitchen is kind of a mess. And yeah, my kids do run around a little crazy, but this, this is my life. I want to share it with you. And, and I love being invited over for dinner because I get to see that same layer to people's lives. You see each other differently when you gather around that common table. You break bread together. There's a reason why we still gather around a common table and break bread together. It changes is the way that you see each other as family. As Christians, ultimately, we are a people of a family-style shared table. Paul is telling Philemon, you can't invite the gospel into your home and not have it change everything, including the way that you see and hold each other. Now, speaking of sharing, there's this word that he uses several times in in Philemon that is translated a number of ways. In my translation just now, it's it's partner or partnership. He refers to the partnership that he has with Philemon. It's this Greek word koinonia, koinonia. And it's a word that sometimes gets translated to mean fellowship. But like so many Greek words in English, we see the very tip of the iceberg in our English translation, and there's so much depth and richness underneath that. Koinonia, the, the partnership that, that, that Paul expresses with Philemon that he wants to see expressed within Philemon's home and in his life. It's, it's the kind of fellowship or partnership where, where you hold each other in your hearts. Like Paul says, Onesimus is in his heart. It's like sending you my heart, he says. And not just that, not just to say we hold each other in our hearts, but it's, the, it's that tangible, tactile expression and outpouring of sharing and generosity that comes when we really mean that. When your problems are really my problems, and your celebrations are really my celebrations, and your sorrows are really my sorrows, when, when I really mean that, and then when I live like that, that's koinonia. It's a hallmark of the early Christian church. In Acts chapter 2, when it says the early Christians shared all things and they sold off their possessions and they gave all that they had to the poor, that was done in the spirit of, you guessed it, koinonia. It's saying that I see you as family, I see you in my heart, I see that you and I are inherently connected, and then I live like that is true. Koinonia. Paul's inviting this koinonia spirit into Philemon's heart and into Philemon's life and into ours as well. Koinonia is what happens when we hold each other in our hearts and then live like that is true. Paul knows that Philemon would be well within his rights to receive Onesimus back, not as a brother, but as a slave, to place the chains right back upon his wrist. Philemon would be well within his legal rights to do this. In fact, his surrounding community might expect him to. In fact, they might think less of him if he doesn't. And Paul, in the same way that he says, I could command you to do the right thing, but I'm going to withhold my power. What is my right to ask you to do something out of a greater power and a greater love? Philemon, would you withhold your power and your right? Would you do something out of a greater calling and a greater love, out of a spirit of koinonia? Would you hold Onesimus in your heart the same way that I do so that it it hurts, so you feel the chains on your wrists? And you see what it looks like in his eyes for you to view him as a brother. This leads leads us to the final layer, the layer that we probably didn't want to hear about this morning, and that is the layer of trust. This story does not happen 
without immeasurable trust. But here's the thing. Even though all we see is the big ask, there is so much more to the story that's not on the page. There are so many little moments and movements and steps of trust that led Onesimus from Philemon's house as slave and master to Rome and back as beloved brothers. When Onesimus flees Philemon, that's a step of trust to say that I'm going to take liberation into my own hands. I will not suffer this abuse, and I trust that something good and beautiful will come from this. Every step he takes towards Rome is a step of trust that not only will he not be caught under a bounty and thrown back into chains, but that he might find this nut job named Paul that could talk some sense into Philemon. Every moment he spends with Paul in conversation around Jesus is trust. Every moment that Paul invests in Onesimus is trust. And then when Paul sends Onesimus, this child that's in his heart, back to a place where he doesn't know the outcome. It's trust. There's trust every single step upon the way, and there's even trust in the ending. When Paul says, I'm writing to you, confident of your obedience, and knowing that you will do more than what I ask. Also, one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me. I hope that I will be released from prison to be with you because of your prayers. Now, that's some audacity. Philemon, do you mind breaking social norms, potentially suffering community ridicule, receiving this person who you've probably been mad at for the last months or years as a brother and not a slave? Oh, and by the way, would you get the comforter fluffed for me? I'd like to come see you. That's trust. It's trust for Onesimus to carry this message, hands trembling, and to hand it to Philemon and to watch his eyes scan each verse and wonder, what is he thinking? What's about to happen? It's trust. Every step on the path of reconciliation, my friends, is one of trust. This is where the story has always been leading. The reason our world is broken and breaking and wounded and wounding so frequently at the foundational level is a lack of trust. We get hurt or we hurt others. Trust is broken, fractured, and because we're not certain of what would happen if we tried to turn back towards one another, then what is certain is more breaking and brokenness, more wounding and woundedness. Trust is the step that leads us back on that path of reconciliation. Trust is what what will lead us in the reconciling love of God from here into eternity. And you might be thinking, Scott, I don't have that kind of trust to make this kind of ask to do something as substantial and significant as this right now. And you're probably right. You may not. I don't know what it is that God is calling you to reconcile. I don't know what it is in your life that feels broken or breaking. I don't know where you are in your journey. But what I do know is this. We don't need trust for the whole thing right now. All we need is enough trust to take that next faithful step. Maybe it's the step away from Philemon and into liberation. Maybe it's the step towards Rome and an uncertain future. Maybe it's a step towards Paul and that deeper discipleship. Maybe it's a step back to Colossae, not as we were, but as something new and greater. Maybe you have just enough trust for that next single step, but the path of reconciliation is a path of trust. And I know what you're thinking now. We got to the ask But Philemon leaves us hanging, doesn't it? What happened? What happens next? Does Philemon open his arms and hug him? Or does he grab the shackles and place them back on his wrists? Does Paul stay in the guest room? The answer to that one is probably not. Rome would be his final destination. We don't know if Philemon and Onesimus are reconciled. We don't know how that story is resolved. But if Paul was sitting here today and writing a letter to you and me the same way he wrote to Philemon, he might ask us the same question he asks that we ask of this letter. What happens next? Because Onesimus isn't just standing in front of Philemon. He's standing in front of you and in front of me. We've been delivered this message, this gospel of reconciliation that is cosmically large 
and also intimately small. We've been told everything that Philemon has been told, and we might have just enough trust to take one faithful step, but the question remains, what happens next? So wherever you are in your journey, whatever God is calling you to reconcile, don't just look for the answers in here. Allow this to inform what happens in here and what happens next. What happens next? Amen. Mm -hmm.